I'm Graham. This is The Big Interview. Our guest uh, this week is Simon Stainrod. Have I taken a risk? Maybe. Simon's greatest playing days were perhaps before some of you began watching football. Not before mine. And many of you I know will not only remember Simon as an outrageously gifted but also outrageously cheeky footballer. And I mean that in the best possible sense. The ball, to him, wasn't simply a friend, but a friend with whom he could get out and do ridiculous things on a Saturday afternoon or a Wednesday night. To my way of thinking, he came from a special family. Now, I don't mean the Stainrods, much as though I guess, given how Simon's turned out, they must be pretty special, but that family that included Frank Worthington, Stan Bowles, Duncan McKenzie, Tony Curry, and in the modern time, Zidane, Valeron, Chabi Prieto, men of um, impressive size, height, power sometimes, but unified by being witty, creative, anarchic. We call them mavericks. I call them one of the main reasons that you and I love football. Beyond that, Simon is a special man. He's funny, he's a really good friend to have, he's intelligent, he's inquisitive, he takes risks, he's hell of a good fun to go out with. Falkirk fans, this is going to be, I predict, the only wonderful footballer of European class who ends up tearful at the memory of Falkirk Football Club and Brockville. This is a guy who I first met he tells me, <laughs> at Dundee when he was manager, a guy with whom I mucked about during uh, World Cup 98 in France, a guy whose wedding I went to, a guy who every time I talk to him either makes me laugh or makes me learn something new. He is as entertaining off the pitch as he was on the pitch, and you're going to hear that now. This is Simon Stainrod at his best, one of the most entertaining men and footballers you could ever wish to know about. By now, you know the kind of thing I'm going to say because for better or worse, you've been listening to me and our wonderful guests on this series. This, fittingly, given that it's Simon Stainrod, is a first. We're in one of those beautiful London Victorian structures, sitting beneath a steel and glass canopy in St Pancras Station. Across from me is an internationally renowned, talented, maverick, clever footballer who's looking at me with grave, grave doubts. And therefore, Although you'll hear him snorting with laughter at some of my questions, you'll also hear the Eurostar pulling out, some announcements about security. For the moment, we've got Simon Stainrod. Bonjour, monsieur. Bonjour. Comment allez-vous? You see, uh, Simon's got it all. Talent, looks, and the French language. Simon, I want to get straight to the nub of the matter. See you had a bout of insomnia. Which sport would you put on the television to induce sleep? <laughs> Now, yeah, football. Why? It's all the same. Yeah. No imagination, no mavericks, no fun. Everything's measured, everything's controlled. Pitches are all perfect, balls are all perfect, boots are all perfect, fans are all perfect. Ish. Ish. Are you saying it's a kind of Stepford Wives, like robotic production line, everything's the same and it's all controlled? Groundhog Day, Stepford Ooh. Wives. Oh, nice. But, like, if that's the case, what, for your personal taste, have we lost? What are the things that are absent that, if you could do a sort of laboratory experiment and re-inject them into football, should come back? Bad pitches? No, you don't need bad pitches, you don't need bad balls, but what you do need is to play in adverse conditions, not weather conditions, conditions whereby you might have to battle for 10 minutes with an injury. You might have to challenge yourself mentally to be able to fight against something that can't be replaced immediately by the second, the third sub. The, the, the safety element in the game now is just not a combat sport anymore. I mean, the reason I played football was because I'd seen George Best playing. And what I saw was 
a bullfighter. Somebody that he put the red cloth out and he said, come and kill me. And that's exactly what the sport likes now. There, there is only one that's doing it, and that's, that's Messi. Everybody knows the name George Best, even to this day, because like Elvis, like Marilyn Monroe, he's become an icon, an icon that's deserved because he was, he was beautiful, he was the world's first big football superstar, even though there'd been famous players before him. He was divinely gifted. He had gifts like Messi. I think there are some similarities in, in what they do with a slalom, with the ball. But that, that thing about come and get me if you can, why did that appeal to a young Simon Stainer? What did you see that you liked in that? That you had to be different, that you had to use skill and not strength, and that you had to uh, have a, a, a real imagination. And, you know, as a kid growing up, I used to be in a garden and pretending to play against Norman Hunter or pretending to play against Tommy Smith. <laughs> and, and, Two and, good names and, to choose. And I'm, and I'm, like, in my mind, yeah. I'm like Alan Hudson or George Graham. No, George, you know, I know I see you frowning there, but George was, like, very, very slick and very, very cool. And, uh, you know, I, I like watching George. Cause he, he, Stroller, he was called Stroller for a reason. He, he had an unbelievable Stroller's attitude to the game. And yet, was the French word is efficace, which is like you're just very, very uh, util. You, you, the right things happened. Yeah, you, you don't have to run around like a maniac. You don't. You don't have to be told where to be, what to do. You just know it. And I never played football to be a success. I never played football to earn money. I never played football to win anything. I played football for fun, and I played football for fun practically all my life. It's funny when you say that. I, I often say, so people might be tired of hearing it, I, I wish there was a visual series, because that stain rod grin has started, crept from your eyes yeah. in, in to, to, to the sides of your mouth now. And I, and I know that's not only when you're telling the truth, but when it comes from the heart, and it's absolutely spot on. There'll be a lot of people we know, um, because when I said on Twitter that I'd had the best morning of my Euro, Euro Copa two years ago, and put a picture of you and me grinning like idiots into the... There was a flood of people. Is Simon coming on the big interview? So there's a lot of people who know you and know the people we've been talking about, but there have been an awful lot of people who are too young to know about Osgood and Worthington and Hudson and Stan Bowles, even Peter Barnes. Let's stop a while at Tony Curry. People don't remember Tony Curry. Just help us with the first time you saw him, but a real-time description, what does he look like, what was that? Because to me, I'm already envisaging, you know, the size of the athlete, the balance, the grace, you know, the 70s hairstyle, mm. which was kind of like... Yeah, no. I'm pretty sure that Royal Rovers has modelled on him, but I'll shut up and, and over at the guy who knew him. He's just the nicest person you could ever meet until you got in the dressing room just before a game, at which time he took over completely and just insisted that everybody gave him the ball every, every time they got it. That was all he wanted. He said, every time you get it, just give it to me. It will be all right. And uh, he had an unbelievable faith in his ability to transport players that weren't on his level to better things. And um, he had to be a little bit careful because he'd got knee injuries. But in training, you know, he's, he's a bear. He's like, you know, he's quite a hairy fella. Right? You wouldn't have to dress him up much to, to, to be a bear. He can pick people up with one hand. You know, I've seen him holding off people with his arm out, shielding the ball, and they're really having a go at him to, to, to get it. And it's, it's like nothing to him. But he, he, is, he, he has a strength, physical strength, that I've never seen in another player. And he's at Sheffield United. He's a director now, Sheffield United. Uh, I was watching my son train him. So and he stopped the car and said, uh, what are you doing here? i like, oh, TC, nice to see you. And he came out and gave me a love light and broke three ribs. <laughs> he's like, he's just, he's just the strongest man. But back in the day the as well, like he was very much of the 70s. And that, so he, I, I, as a kid watching him on television, I could see the sway, I could see the balance. For me, 
body shape and movement when he was on the ball and when he wanted to sell a lie to a player and go yeah. one, tell him to go one way and he'd go the other. He reminded me a little bit, or him and Zidane have things in common. Very, very similar to Zidane, and Zidane is also a superhuman in his strength. Like, you know, he just he, he can hold off three or four players in one arm whilst working out which trick he's going to do and how he's going to embarrass you. And, uh, and they just see it differently. And uh, TC was, for me, the best player I've ever seen uh, or been on a pitch with. He, he could just do anything. He did struggle a little bit with, with injuries, which you know affected him a little bit mentally, I think. He, he found it hard not to be able to do the things that he could do because he was restricted. They're all happening in his head by, still, by, yeah. but the knees are saying no. You know, we'll pass to Tony in a second, but you talked about entertainment and not only what you tried to do, and but this thing that we've we've fallen in love with, players who would make your journey to a match great, even if your team had lost. Or Did Tony sometimes do things for the sake of flair? Or was the elegance that I saw simply always applied to uh, moving do, the ball upfield. Was he a showman like you or he, not? He'd do things for his yeah, he was, he'd do things for his own satisfaction. He played against Everton. And I, I was at this game as a kid and I'd be about fifteen or sixteen. And they were playing Everton when Everton had a really good midfield and Alan Ball was playing against him. Probably Howard Kendall as well yeah, yeah. And um, Alan Ball had been giving him some stick and they played at Everton and he uh, said ah, Tony Curry he's, he's not this he's not that and um, I don't know what the score was but there was a, a moment in the game I think United were winning maybe 1-0 and um, TC got a ball uh, from a throwing controlled it turned and Alan Ball was in front of him and he sat on the ball actually sat on the ball yeah but it, ain't that what it's about that's is it. that not what it's about? Is it, watch you it. know, if you go to theatre, do you just got to be bored? <laughs> you know, you go and watch a concert, and uh, you, you want to go and watch some heavy rock, and you get this acoustic guitar out. Yeah, so like, I just love. I, I, you, you get such a chance when you're playing fo- football. If I was a, if I was a defender, I would love to to have the challenge of like trying to hurt me. I would I would love that. You know, th- th- and. That's, to me, it's what it's all about, and it's, it's what has disappeared completely. Over the years, I've seen I've seen others in that. I'm not saying they're the same off the pitch, but I thought I think Letizia fits into the. Oh, he's fantastic! It's the beauty of the internet is that you can see these players now quite easily, and quite often, if I've like got five minutes, I'll just put on Matt Letizia or, or Frank Worthington that goal against Ipswich it's like some people it put sort of Barocca in their, in their water in the morning just to give a little lift yeah, yeah. all you need is a five minute injection exactly. of if you, Frank if, Worthington if, if, if you'll you, pardon the expression if, if, if you watch Matt, Matt Letizia's goals because he actually played just after me really and TV had just moved yeah. on a bit yeah yeah. so you've got more of his action and I, I watch him and I'm so jealous it's like he's got all these great goals like and uh, you know You've not got so many of the, the just that slight generation before. Do you know what I saw him doing, Simon? And I think that I, I mean I was unlucky in that clearly because when you were um, probably at the peak of your career, I, I, we weren't able in Scotland to be watching you live every week like like now. I mean if I, if there had been blanket coverage of that football, then it doesn't. It wasn't all perfect. There was there was a, a, a spirit of football around Europe, if not England, of Catanaccio. Some of the kicking um, was was brutal and nasty yeah, for, yeah. for no good reason that I, I'm not a fan of. There was hooliganism. So let, let's not sell, you know, porridge and say it's diamonds. But had there been more coverage of players like you and the players we've been talking about, then the numbers watching numbers watching in television would be you know quintuple what they are right think now. So wouldn't you? You'd think that people no would be moved by you know a bit of uh, a bit of artistry, a bit of like take the mickey out of somebody and. Uh, I, a player I, I watched live recently, and I wasn't, I, I hadn't made my mind up about him. I watched him live in a, a friendly game for Brazil against Uruguay, and I came away loving him, Neymar. Yeah. He got kicked to death yeah. in this game, and he kept getting the ball, kept taking the mickey out of him, and he kept, he was like a throwback. He was like, you know, and I, I looked at him and I thought, who would I rather watch, Messi or, or, or Neymar? If, that, if that's your question, you need to you need to watch Messi more because the, no, there's only one answer. I know, I, I, I know and you're right, but he, I mean, he just 
You just had such fun getting kicked. I, I'm not a fan of about 35% of what he does or how he lives. And I, I, I kind of wish that you could change that 35% because then at that stage, you'd have a proper competition up the top between the top two right now. He got a couple of megs in this game. Uh, uh, and Cavani is playing against him. And, and, they're, and they're having a little bit of a ding-dong at each other. Like, you know, it's a chance for him to settle a bit Take of... Take some club rivalries like, out with each other, and, yeah. Uh, and <laughs> I, I think it was done in good faith. I think they both wanted to have a go at each other, but in the sporting sense. Whilst, I buy that. Whilst being aggressive. I buy that. It's like if a ball fell between me and Frank Worthington on the halfway line, when I was a young kid... It's all off and, until the and, ball's and, won. And, and, like, uh, and I've got a chance. I'm thinking, like, oh, I've got a chance I'm going to make him. And he did. Uh, Neymar megged him. And it was just... And, and Cavani was after him and after him. And he, you know, he passed it off and he couldn't do anything about it. See, it that, like, that's what you made me think when you started this little section talking about Tiss. And what I saw in him, like you're talking about Neymar, I wonder if I can not make a man. What I see in players like your ilk, the people we've talked about and we stopped on Tiss for a second, is that total faith in themselves, total control of the ball, and then that recurring thought, well, I wonder if I can do it this way. I wonder if I can draw them and do that. I wonder if I can put it through the, the legs this way. Can I find that corner from this angle? Can I lob him and then volley it? That, that, that curiosity is, is man's inventiveness that will find... Penicillin and we'll allow Beethoven and put the notes in the right order. It's the yep. same spiritual instinct of going, I wonder if I can do it like e- this. E- exactly, exactly. But having talked about all these people, it, there's a slight risk in talking about somebody who was exactly like these people, but you encountered at the dog end of his career. And, and the name is Jimmy or Jinky Johnston. Um, you, because TV wasn't so prevalent then, I don't think you can have seen much of him for Celtic in the day when... Celtic fans, particularly those who saw Jock Steen's team beat Inter Milan and, and go all the way to the European final before they beat Inter Milan and, and reach a European Cup final three years later in 1972. There would have been a lot of people of knowledge who'd have argued that Jinky was one of the great players in the world. And by the time he ends at Sheffield United, age and whatever, means that he's not. But what can you, what can you tell me about the late, great Jinky Johnson? Well, the first time I saw him playing... My dad got me out of bed and said, you have to come down and watch this player. Uh, and he was playing in a European game and the pitch was very muddy and he was getting absolutely kicked to death. And every time he got kicked to death and he got a free kick, he just put the ball down and he gave it to him again. And they kicked him again. And he did, and he got his socks down. And that's... I used to play my socks down. And the, the reason is him. He's just... I loved it. First football shirt I ever had was Jimmy Johnston, number seven, Celtic. This is the reason we do this series, because sometimes when you ask a question, you hear the most outrageous thing. I can't believe it. When, when I watched him playing there, I just thought, wish I could do that. What did he still have at Sheffield United? But- I was Jimmy's chauffeur for a while. He lived not very far from me, so I used to pick him up in the morning and take him to work um, for a licence issue, I think. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> he, was, he was very funny. He was charming. But I can remember playing some games with him and just thinking, like, how on earth does he do that? It's just like the ball is, is literally tied to his foot. He just, you cannot imagine it unless you're seeing it and you're thinking, you know, he's, you know he's old. But I'm, I'm so glad that I played with him. But I wish that I just had the memory of him. Do you know what I mean? If I'd just seen him play. Bet365 are our sponsors on this. But I'm pretty sure I know that Steve Freeth has sent this in. And I know why. He's a baggy. And, and Steve is asking, did you really choose Aston Villa over Barcelona? It's a bit more complicated than that. But there yes. you go, Steve, I told you. It, yes? It is yes. But um, the... the, the, the it's a long story, uh, Barcelona. Um, I didn't fancy the Juan Gaspar fella who was... He became chairman, I think. He did, he did. He was vice president in your day and he became yeah. president. <coughs> and, it didn't uh, go too well. I'd been to... Bar- well, I was in Barcelona. I talked about a contract. We were doing a two-year deal. A two-year deal, partly not just because of your ability, but partly because 
one of your mentors, a guy who believed in you, Terry Venables, had been recruited from the club you were at, QPR, yeah. to take over in 1984 T at the T Camp Now. TV before he took me to um, uh, over there for a chat, and he was managing QPR, took me for lunch to a place not far from here in Curzon Street in Mayfair. And uh, we had the same thing to eat, strangely enough. <laughs> it's funny what you remember, eh? It's what was happening. Oh, very nice. And uh, um, he asked me a question. He said, if you could go to a top European team and take a risk or stay at QPR and play to be in Europe, go on, maybe even challenge to win the title because we've got a good team and we were going to get better players. He wanted to sign Lineker, you know, uh, he was ambitious. He said, but if you'd been offered a, a big job in a top, top European club, what would you do? And I said, well, I'd go. And he was asking, he was, I thought he was asking for me. He was asking about himself. <laughs> he got me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, he, so I said, no, no. Knowing you, you should have asked it differently. Uh, so, <laughs> that was the so, only. <laughs> So, that was the only way you were going to read it. I know. So, exactly. <laughs> Who's tapped me up, boss? <laughs> <laughs> so, I can hear him scratching my head as I walked out of that meeting. <laughs> so, apart from you doing him and sort of saying, yeah, I'd go, boss, when he was... He asked you to make fair for smoked salmon to ask your opinion. Yeah, yeah. We went out for lunch and... Uh, that's, yeah. that's not bad. Yeah, that's how you should do it. Really. It's a position of respect. So then, obviously, he went uh, uh, to Barcelona and I had a tough time at QPR after he left. Uh, I found it difficult training with uh, the people that took over. Alan Mullery. Well, Alan Mullery was one and Frank Sibley uh, was the other one. And when Alan Mullery got the sack, Frank Sibley took over. And, uh, uh, I got sent off in two games for fighting. Everton on the Saturday and Ipswich on the Tuesday. <laughs> You couldn't do that now. <laughs> no. You'd be banned. So I got suspended by the club for two weeks. And in that time, uh, I got Sheffield Wednesday to buy me. So uh, I went to Sheffield Wednesday. <laughs> and uh, I had a right laugh with Howard Wilkinson. But Barcelona and Aston Villa, what happened there? You just didn't, you turned Barcelona no, down? No, or? I was uh, at, at um, Sheffield Wednesday before Aston, Aston Villa. So I'm at Sheffield Wednesday. Yeah. I played there for about nine months. <laughs> I had uh, we had a meeting at Sheffield Wednesday, uh, and I I don't know if you remember how they played Sheffield Wednesday, but they were very very direct. It was like Wimbledon, Watford, and Sheffield Wednesday. And uh, I'm trying to remember your coach, but it doesn't come to me. Howard Wilkinson. Howard. Oh my God. So okay. uh, and he used to be our school teacher, Howard, and we've never got on. I mean, I, I love him. And I think he's very funny. He's very dry. Mis misunderstood because he's so dry. But he's so dry that I actually get him, like, you know, I like him. And um, he signed me. And when we had a meeting before I signed, he said, what do you think you can bring to the club? I said, well, I'll be able to hold the ball up up front. I'll um, make goals and I'll score surprising goals. So you get a goal out of nothing every now and again. And, you know, he said, well, that's exactly what we're looking for. He said, we're looking to move on to the next step. That's exactly what we're looking for. So uh, I signed for Sheffield Wednesday, which was handy because it's like hometown and all that. And I thought, you know, Premier League, it's, it's good. It's Crossing like, the divide. They, they but... were doing, yeah, and they're doing well. And, um, and you know, the, I thought it was going to be main man, you know. So I turned up there and uh, in my place was a pair of running shoes. And uh, he just took me running for about four weeks. And then my first game was Norwich away. And I was, I was actually on the bench and he brought me on. And the, fir the first ball was a sky out. It was like, you know, 90 metres in the sky, on the wing. Very, very difficult to bring it down and go and do something with it. And I'm watching it and I just caught it on my foot and back heel it or somebody. And uh, the lads on the bench said he wanted to bring me off and play the 10 men. <laughs> <laughs> he, said, he said, what have I signed here? <laughs> Next thing, I got brought down for a penalty and uh, I wanted to take it. I'm not a big penalty taker, but I wanted to take it and Andy Blair took it and missed. But it, it, went, it went wholly wrong 
very soon with uh, Howard when we were training and he was preparing the team for the uh, Norwich game and they had a player in midfield who comes short and looks for the ball and starts playoff. So he had me doing that for the reserves. So I'm, I'm coming short and getting the ball off uh, Hesford in goals and he, he rolls me the ball out and Andy Blair, who's playing for the first team, comes to close me down. I sold him a, a little dummy, clipped the ball over the top and the left winger, a uh, young lad from the reserves, like went through and had a shot at goal. And Howard Wilkinson came on, he went, no, 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 stop it, stop it, get the ball back to Hezzy. So the ball goes back to Hezzy. Andy, Andy, give me a bib. So he puts his bib on. And so Howard, no. we, we set it up again and Hesford rolls me the ball out. I do a little move like that and I megged him, clipped it over the top <laughs> and the lad went through and scored. Right? <laughs> he, didn't, he didn't say anything. He walked off the pitch and his assistant, Mick Inigan, who was a little bit mad as well, followed him and they were chatting and, and uh, Howard went in. Mick Inigan came by and he said, right, get yourselves into groups of four, you on this corner, you on this corner. And uh, all we did was run in and, and uh, press up some burpees <laughs> for about an hour and a half. And uh, all the lads were going like, yeah, yeah, glad we signed you. <laughs> it's like... I wasn't thrown out of the cops. I was a really good detective. I just chose to leave. And I'm sensing a connection here. Howard Wilkinson, Simon Stainrod, Howard Wilkinson, Eric Cantona. Yes, Alex, that Cantona, I'm, you can have him, no problem at all. Yeah. The man who... You know the story or not? Well, he doesn't seem to quite like the characters that, that we do that we base this interview upon, no. Well so, well, so now I'm manager of Dundee and Howard brings Dundee Football Club up and speaks to my secretary, Isabel. She puts through a call for me from Howard Wilkinson. So, I, I'm like, Howard Wilkinson, right, OK. Howard, how, how are you? I'm all right. Uh, they'll know that cunt can't now. What's, uh, what's I think about him? He's played in France and uh, they've seen him. I said, Howard? I said, he's one of the top six players in the world. I said, he can do anything, but you won't like him. All right? He said, OK, fine, thank you. On go, gone. Never spoke to him again until they won the league. I got invited to the Football Writers' Dinner in London, where he was presented with the Manager of the Year Award. And I saw him, we're all there in our dicky bowls, like, you know, and he comes up. And he says, they were right about that, cunt Cantona. <laughs> and like, I, I saw him talking to Alex Ferguson that night, and I thought, aye, aye. I could imagine him going to play for him, but not, not for him, you know? What would you be like? It's how things happen. I, yeah, it would have been funnier still if you'd said, if you'd said well, I'll, I'll take him if you. <laughs> you want to loan him out. It, it's, what, what did you think about Eric in... Um, in England, because he seems to represent a point that the, the apogee of the. If we we talked about the era of you know yourself and Tony Curry and Hudson and Osgood and Worthington and whatever, there was an era in the Premier League when it wasn't like we started this conversation when it wasn't anodyne, it wasn't robotic. There was De Canio, yeah, De and there Canio. was Bergkamp, yeah, and even in goals, Schmeichel was exactly what we've been talking about. What? Although he's very good at his job, and there was Zola, and there was even Benny Carboni, and the. Everywhere you well, look. Can you imagine Sheffield Wednesday? You've got, I think, at the same time, maybe Chris Waddle, Carboni, and Di Canio. At or around. Can, 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 at or around. Well, uh, it's it's a joy, imagine? it's a joy. It does seem like a dream now. But Eric must be the apogee of, of all of that because whether he's better than all the players we've talked about, he seemed to be a, a, a totem pole where the Premier League went. Well, France didn't appreciate you. You know, it's actually the no, best. Exactly. <laughs> the, the guy who throws his things at referees and shouts and swears, and the French were like, and the, the Premier League was the place where that will bring all your your weak and your huddled masses. Moment. He's a king. He's fantastic. Mm. He practices. He turns up his collar, and it, it was an extraordinary time. And it, and it maybe his big benefit <laughs> was timing. And and the hint now is that maybe Manchester United are going to be smart enough to bring him back. But what did you view the Cantona years? How did you view the Cantona years? Um, Watching. Well, I played against him when I was in France, and uh, I, I knew 
it merits a description. I, I, my, we were playing uh, for, for Strasbourg. To, we were supposed to play Marseille, and uh, all the lads were talking about his player Cantona, and uh, he wasn't going to play because he'd had a fallout with a coach because he'd been brought off in a game and he'd taken his shirt off and thrown it in the coach's face, and he was banned for for a little bit. And uh, thank God he wasn't going to be playing. And so we played Marseille. We played quite well. Actually, we were very unlucky not to get a draw. My fault. I, uh, instead of heading it and scoring, I, I went for a volley and hit the bar. So, my fault. Anyway, and about two weeks later, and we've got a home game coming up. Is the Marseille of Papin up front? Yeah, yeah. Papin, um, the two centre halves were Bernd Forster and uh, Moser, the Brazilian. Oh, Moser was great. Uh, they were the best two centre halves I ever Batistone played. Batistone would have still been playing, I Batistone, think. Batistone, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah they, they were proper. Yeah. And uh, it was probably the best uh, best Marseille team that they had. And then they added Chris Waddle as well, like you know, which made him even better. So uh, we've got a home game coming. We, we missed a week for International Week or whatever. And we've got a home game coming up and we're playing Bordeaux. And uh, um, he, he was actually uh, loaned out to Bordeaux and, and played in this game. And he, he played that game... It's his first game, so you probably want him to impress, right? He played that game. I don't think I saw him run once. And every touch of the ball was one touch. He never, never brought a ball down and played anybody in. He just played one touch. It's like he was in the dressing room before the game. He was like, uh, what, what would really, really amuse me today <laughs> is to not run and just touch it once every time I get it. And he did it. And you, it's like, it was like um, a coaching manual. It's like, you know, 90 minutes of how to play one touch. You could have played for Liverpool when you had a good team, you know. He'd have just walked straight in and gone like, oh, you play one touch, right, boom, 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 boom. It was unbelievable. And when I said that to Howard, that, like, you know, you won't like him, Howard would never be able to uh, deal with that uh, individual temperament. Whereas uh, um, Alex Ferguson would embrace the individual temperament and make more of that individual temperament by making the team play better for that individual. Contrary with, with Howard, he would make the individual try to play better for the team. And uh, I, think, I think Alex's way works better. Have you put your finger in that description? You have to be really good, though. Yeah. You do, of course you do. Yeah, you, special. You, you know, you can't. You can have an off day, but you can't have two. But that idea of of taking the team and putting it so that the great player exprims, brings out his very best, or the idea of taking a great player or any good player and saying system first. Have you put your finger on why we we don't have today the types of players we've been talking about over all these? these anecdotes that, that systems rule because mm. there's no patience for the individual the, you know and, and the, the big problem is the people who are coaching the teams are educated to coach teams they're not how, how do you coach Eric Cantona you, 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 don't, you don't you don't coach him you you mentor him you you, you know you, you can't tell him how to play but you can put ideas in his head. My question to you would be, you, you probably tried to convince him. Yeah, yeah, you cajole him a little bit. You don't, you're not trying to change him. My, my little lad was playing when he was 14 for a Sunday league team. At, at 12, he'd been to a professional club and um, didn't really enjoy the discipline and the you play this way and you play that way and when it's there you have to pass it there mm -hmm. and he, 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 he wasn't enjoying that so I said well just go and play for your Sunday team and just play your own football and if you're going to dribble, dribble if you're going to shoot, shoot if you're going to cross it, cross it but make sure that if you're playing you play with a smile on your face and you score goals and you make goals that's all you've got to do and then when it gets to the time we'll go back you can always put your bike in the seat so you give them that space to, to, to develop or I have I don't think everybody does it because not, not everybody has my experience so um, I, I, 
I want um, I, I, I want to see coaches um, give the responsibility back to the players and that, I sometimes see teams training where they'll have a game on and there'll be three coaches coaching the game and they'll stop the game and they'll say in this situation do this and in this situation do that and I was asked the question by his Sunday team's coach he didn't know that I'd been in football until this moment like you know and then he's googled me and he's gone you know he's been coming for two years and never said a word and like he said why have you never said anything he said well it's not my job to say anything you're the coach so like you know I'm not going to stick my nose in I just went to play and enjoy himself and he is doing he said, well, can't you come and do a session? I went, nope. He said, well, could you tell me like what you would do if you did a session? I said, I'd come. I'd put a bag of balls down. I'd put four cones down. I'd put some vests, some bibs down. And I'd go inside and have a cup of tea. <laughs> and I said, and what you find is, for ten minutes, they're all stood around doing nothing. I said, and then somebody will go like, well, he ain't going to come out, is he? So we better do something. So let's pick two teams. So the fella that's decided, he's your captain. You know. When, now, you tell us who's going to pick the two teams. So he says, well, it's best if we have two even ones. So we'll pick the two best players. So he picks your two best players for you. And then they're picking the teams. <laughs> so the last two that get picked are going like, we better have a go here. <laughs> And all of a sudden, you haven't done anything. But you've done so much more than going like, listen, when you get it there, if he pulls away from you, he's going to make a really good angle. And he's going to come in and he's going to make a nice little triangle there. And it's like, you know... It's... There are three small themes left, although I'd like this to be the first part of a series of seven, if you don't mind, like Alan Fluff Freeman, History yeah, of Pop. Yeah, yeah. Our sponsors, Bet365, are, are going to ask you in a minute, not now, but in a minute, what are your memories the 1982 FA Cup final but right now I have to pick up a theme you were talking about top clubs coming to you and asking your advice your help with players that have a little bit of a street about them players that still have a little bit of um, the artful dodger about them and you found one you found one I, in, I, in Dembele I, I, and, I did, yeah. and and you know right now I look at him I think I'm really privileged for all the flaws I can see and what some of the conversations with football people have taught me not to look at the things he can't do or doesn't do but look at the thing that he does do and I'm really privileged that right now Dembele and Vinicius are coming through at the same time in La Liga at a time when Cristiano Ronaldo's gone away and Leo Messi's going to be 32 in June but, but Dembele was you know you knew about his raw extraordinary talent when he was at Ren. He never and, played a first team game. When and he, he should have been at City, but he isn't. Mm. And the Nice coach probably went to sleep on watch when Patrick Vieira was still. I don't think he went to sleep on watch. I think he had. Why isn't he Why had, isn't Dembele a City player then? Because he had rules, probably life rules, that applied to him, which he applied to this situation. Patrick did. Yeah. So he didn't want a player who would never played a game in anyone's first team to come to Man City and say, I want a number for the squad and uh, I'm, I'm better. Uh, he wasn't being big-headed. Uh, I'm better than anybody that's playing in your team. And he is. He, he, he is. You know? Usman Dembele is utterly extraordinary. Well, I'm so happy because like, I've been so worried about him. No, he's like uh, flawed, Simon, and, and and immature, still to learn, but he's with had the personality so much to learn. Stupid stick in the press, like yeah. oh, that's not true. And if anybody hasn't no, watched no. Usman Dembele, we're talking about a player who Simon knew, spotted, and and was in a, in a position to advise clubs about when when Dembele was still in the academy at, at Rennes before Dortmund, and he's now, albeit with bumps, you know, he's bumps about sleeping in and missing training and missing team meetings. Is, is, is Barcelona without him and when Barcelona without him they're a lesser team mm. already and the kids you know half or well, a third of the way through his second season let, one season at Dortmund he, he's beyond where he should be and he's let, literally let, extraordinary let, 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 let me tell you what he does when he's got the ball if he's going to make a pass and there are two choices he makes the pass that's most dangerous 
and mix it well. If he's going to dribble, he can beat a player in so many different ways. If he's going to cross it, he can whip it in, he can chip it up, he can like cut it back, left footed or right footed. He's completely ambidextrous. He's completely ambidextrous. He can shoot with his left foot the same as he shoots with his right foot. He don't know which way he's going to go. He's got an acceleration from zero to 60 that's like a Porsche. There's nobody in the planet, Simon, that plays football right now that goes from standing to that fast. Un- unbelievable. It, it, there is literally nobody. But I think Mbappé's a really good player, mm. but a great player is Usman Dembele. I, I think M- 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 Mbappé is a really, really good striker. Mm. Usman is a really, really good footballer. U- Usman's got a fantasy. Um, he'll, he'll put bums on seats whether the ball goes in the net or not. He's got a weird imagination about yeah. what to do. He's still... I mean, he, I would argue that although I'm aware that he's got really strong personality and I'm also aware that he is where he always wanted to be. He's been Barca fascinated, he's been Messi fascinated. It, and, he is. And it should work for him. I, I think that his... his Football maturity age is is not above where his his passport age, and it might be eighteen months below it. Because I think I've watched him smelling the coffee. He's got all the gifts. He's always known he's going to make it because the gifts are there. He doesn't have athletic problems. He doesn't have injury repetitively. He's he's not full of he's not surrounded by bad people. It's all going to happen. But that whole thing about how hard he's had to work for it to happen. I'm I'm not certain about, but you see at Football Club Barcelona right now, with solid, tough men around him, Messi included, when they're when they're they've giving instruction, on, they've, he's listening. They've latched onto, they've latched him, onto him. But I I see the the quid pro quo. Yeah. He's going, ah, okay. Now Mbappe because he's got good people and he's quite a strong, bright guy to and tough. I think he found that quicker. I think he understood it. He's much he's much more likable. Uh, because he, he puts himself more in the press and he has a charm and uh, uh, of someone that's more seasoned and, uh, you know, he, he, he's, like, much older than he's years. Season's a great word. That's, that's exactly and, the difference. And, he, 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 uh, and if I was manager of Man United, I'd probably, today, buy Mbappé to play in my team as opposed to Usman. But Usman is a better player. But, but Man United are not as good as Barcelona. We're going back to your question about, your, your point about big, big clubs saying, Simon, give me somebody who's anarchy, who's rock and roll, who's a little bit different, who's young, who's un, who's they not Stepford Wives. They, yeah, but they, they, don't, they don't want anarchy. They, they just want someone who's easy on the eye, you know, passes forward quickly. Uh, Never makes too many stupid mistakes, but they, uh, and has a little bit of imagination yeah. to do, you know, things which make a goal. But they don't. They don't. Today's people. They don't. They don't want someone who's too difficult, really. Behaviour-wise, they don't. And before um, before I draw you to a, a, a final section, bet three six five. What are your memories of the 1982 FA Cup final? My memory is you standing on the pitch doing, I think, a BBC interview. When the guy, not, not knowing you then, I, I look back now and I laugh, and, and the guy, the interviewer, is like, Simon, um, and you're in your, your Bob suit. Bob Wilson. Is it Bob? Yeah. Are you, are you, are you quite confident? I mean, any sentence that starts to you, are you quite confident? Mm. <laughs> it's already a wasted question. Oh, yeah, we'll win. Yeah, we're quite, I'm quite, yeah, I was quite sure. We'll Absolutely. Win. Glenn Rodgers was quite posh. You were very, uh, yeah, you were very question, well yeah. behaved, yes. Yes, yes. yes. yes I would rather th- <laughs> answer our chances, yes. And, um, um, sweet memories, do you remember much of it? The adrenaline, the, the, the what? First thing, it's not all that long uh, after my sister died. It's a couple of years after my sister died that we played in the cup final. I had no idea. A few years. I had no idea. Four years. And when the band played Abide With Me, it really got me before the game. I was in the toilets sobbing. Yeah. Why wouldn't you be? And um, um, that's probably my most important memory. Mm. Um, The game, the first game... 
Yeah, yeah. It was just a game where you know you're playing against Spurs. They're, they're, they're not easy. You've got like Perryman who like you know rubs you up the wrong way all the time and protects Hoddle. Uh, you've got Graham Roberts who just wants to wind you up and kill you. Uh, Murray centre half. Is it Murray? They were they were a difficult team to play against. And they were quite a successful team. They were crooks and Archibald up front. Yeah, yeah, good forwards. Yeah, very, yeah. very good forwards. Nice who, who, who suited the way that Glenn Hoddle played because he used to, as balls came into him from fullbacks, he'd just clip them into the space for two quick forwards. It was very, very difficult to defend against. Um, and um, the first game, I was just so pleased that we that we drew that. You know, it was like. Uh, um, we, we, we scored long throw, flicked on by Bob Hazel and, and Fenn heads it in. And uh, I don't know how long was left when we scored, but you know we, we had extra time and what have you. Uh, I, I, there's a clip that I saw not too long ago of me getting the ball off the goalie and just rolling it back to him and getting it again. <laughs> so I'm just wanting another game at Wembley, you know. <laughs> and uh, and to be honest, that is what I really wanted. Uh, uh, my it was so special to be at Wembley. Yeah, my ambition as a young lad growing up was to play for England and play at Wembley in a cup final. And um, I just really, more than anything else really, I wanted to play in a cup final. In, 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 uh, f- well, for anybody, you know, I just want to play in a cup final. And um, But not the League Cup, the FA Cup. Had to be the FA Cup. It's a yeah. traditional one, of course it is. Yeah. And... Um, the we had a really good party after the game, and our, our chairman was Jim Gregory, who was a like a well-known London character. And we had really, really good time at the hotel. And I got up early on the, the following morning. It was a really nice day, and we were in a hotel across from Hyde Park, and got all the papers and looked at that. And I thought, oh, this is just great. You know, I was so glad that we got another go at it, and. Uh, uh, and I felt sure that we would win the second game. Um, in, in all honesty, I think we probably, you know, we, we lost one nil, but but um, you know, we, it's a game that we could have won. You know, we had, we were unlucky. We hit the bar. We had a goal disallowed. We had like you know, and we, and we played all right second games. First game, I think we were a little bit timid, and it was hard to get on the ball. I found it hard to get on the ball. But, um, although it's a big pitch at Wembley, I think that Tottenham had done their work like, you know. What we haven't explained to anybody is that, uh, as well as Tottenham being well prepared, they, they were playing week in, week out at a higher level than QPR yeah, were we, because you're still to be promoted. Exactly, yeah, yeah. So we were, if you like, in that in those days, second division team, so a championship team. So it, it'd be like, uh, I don't know, Norwich playing uh, playing Spurs today. And um, But... But we had a team, you know, we had a team. We knew we were good. We were just, we just happened to be made in the second division, transported to the Premier League. And you know, we, I think our first season we finished fifth. I think Premier League. So we weren't, we weren't, you know, we were, we were good enough. Ready for the jump. The way to finish this, I suppose. Um, quiz question, and, and you're allowed to say I don't know, but it concerns you. At which club, given how good you were, which I'm a testimony. To and, and anybody listening now understands fully. Uh, which club were you paid a pound a week? <laughs> our, our, our producer's club. Is our producer <laughs> Neil, uh, yes, at, at Falkirk. Yeah. Your contract stated it. I mean, I just have to say something. What did your career come to that you you were forced to take a pound a week at to Fol- play football at, at, at Falkirk? Falkirk? I I just. I was living a dream. <laughs> I, I told you this is. I told you I, we could do this all day, and he'd, he'd still be coming out with lines like that. I tell you, one of the one of the, the happiest times of my life was playing no, football for Falkirk. He's still not going to pay the bill. Not, the, whatever happens, whatever uh, you say here, why? Freedom and uh, uh, just a general willingness of everyone at the same time to want to do something right everybody you know it didn't end that way but it started that way and it and it and it got to a point where it was far enough along 
for it to be all right. But uh, it was um, when I when I signed well, before I'd signed there. Uh, you know, Jim Jeffries is a very very uh, cautious person, and he wanted to make sure he was getting something that was all right. You know, so they, they got a six aside tournament at Musselburgh. Uh, where Dundee were playing Dundee United, Rangers, Celtic Hibs, Hearts and uh, so we played this six a side competition and, uh, and I played for Falkirk and we, we won it and I got the player of the tournament and, and afterwards uh, I, th- I was thinking like well it's nice of them to let me play in this like you know because I, I, I actually thought it was like their under 21s or under 18s or something I thought you know, and I said, like, you know, it's it good, you know, because I could have done with playing because I'd, I'd been on strike at Rouen, so uh, I, I'd not been playing much. They stopped paying the players, so I decided to go on strike. Withdraw your labour. So, yeah, so um, um, I, I asked uh, David Holmes, who was the chairman at the time, and I said, like, uh, yeah, so it, what is it, under 18 or under 21? No, no, the, they're the first team players. That was the best we've got. And I went like, "Excuse <laughs> me, be all right if I don't get injured." So, anyway, we. Uh, I'm pretty sure that Jim decided it might be all right after that. <laughs> I thought you were like, going to have the punchline would have been that he phoned Howard Wilkinson or Eric Cantona. Uh, said, "Am I going to let this go?" No. To be fair, Jim Jim was an old school manager. But I've never come across a manager who worked as hard as he did. He, he, I mean, he used to go in his car and watch games down in England to try and bring a player back and be training bright and breezy at 10 o'clock the next day. And I, I don't know how he had the energy for it. He, he was so determined. I, he, he, I think it's because he came up through the ranks a little bit and when you earn, when you have to work hard for everything you earn, yeah. you never lose that habit. And he, and he, and he really, really had that uh, grit and determination. Uh, he, he, he should have been. I think he should have been a little bit more. De- he should have defended me a little bit more and, and given me a bit more at the end. Right, you know, I think, I think, because. We, we, we had agreed this pound a week thing wasn't forever. You know, this pound a week was until we got promoted. Without, without saying anything worrying, in case your accountant's listening, there were certain attractions as to how often you played Yeah. financially. Yeah, how often you played, how many goals, and if we won the league. And I, I mean, I know that I, I probably earned around eight times what the best paid player got in that year. You know, it was all, it was all on, on my back. Your name had to be on the team sheet, you had to perform, you had to score, the team had to go up. Yeah. Incentives. And you know what? I never thought about it once. Never, never, ever once. Never thought about anything apart from playing and having fun. Did you feel the love? Is that part of what was ma- what made it fun? Because you, I don't know what the hoops think about you, what Sheffield United... Rome might be a different case, but like at Falkirk, ahead of anything I know, I'd be like you'd literally just adored. And and I guess with your character, that must have felt quite pleasant. Yeah, it was great. I, I have to say, um, you know, I'm not with with the internet. You can always look back now and again, and it's quite nice to look back now and again. And there are interviews on there uh, uh, with the um, uh, BBC or whoever else, and uh, you know. People say nice things, and uh, the, the, but the, the thing with Falkirk was I don't know. It was just, were you there? Well, he, he's produ- I'm asking the producer now. Were you there the day we won the league? Yes. Yeah. When I got on the table with the cup, it's just uh... happy days. Whoa! <laughs> it's so, dear listener, when you ask the right questions sometimes you strike a chord and what you're used to particularly what I'm used to I've spent a week where I went to Porto to speak to Iker Casillas at Barcelona I had a lovely interview with Eric Abidal and with Sam Titi. and you're hoping that you connect you're hoping that you get the right words you're hoping that you get um, a smile and that you'll remember 
when you ask a footballer that I adored and a guy who's become a friend, like, what was it, like a Falkirk? And he was like, the thing that could still potentially reduce me to tears today would be sitting, standing on a table in Neil's hometown and lifting the cup in the air. Ah, that's the beauty of football. That's the gorgeous thing about football. Simon Stainrod, uh, adopted Frenchman, Yorkshireman to the core, Falkirk title winner. This has been a wander through a garden of <laughs> joy. Uh, you're outstanding.